and welcome to the CMH Family Medicine Top Tips and Tutorials. Today we're going to be focusing on hypertension and how we get our newly diagnosed patient on target. And I'm going to very much look at the EML public sector guidelines um, for South Africa. So in South Africa, we still very much classify hypertension um, as the blood pressure over 140 over 90. Internationally, they are um, tightening up some of these targets. Um, and very important to make sure that you've had a couple of readings at least over a couple of visits before you make this diagnosis and start somebody on treatment. Somebody that's in pain, for example, or somebody that's in a distress might also have a high blood pressure at the visit, but might not necessarily have hypertension. So make sure you get that diagnosis correct. Um, and just remember, if they're under 40 years old, um, and they're, especially if they're presenting with grade 2 hypertension, to just go and look for those secondary causes, and you can go and, and look those up. So this is just our classification. I think most of us are very aware of that. We've got those three thresholds for systolics, 140, 160, and 180 for grade 1, 2, and 3, and then 90, 100, and 110 for our diastolic thresholds. Um, and these classifications are becoming more and more important in terms of deciding um, how heavily we're going to go in with our treatment on first diagnosis. So again, in South Africa, our target is to get that blood pressure under 140 over 90, or at least to get the systolic down by 20 and the diastolic down by 10. Um, but we have to be um, a little bit, we can be a little bit more um, cautious in patients, for example, with diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors, and especially also in patients with um, a combination of diabetes and CKD. And then you might consider even setting a lower target. So the general recommendation is that you also try and get people to target quickly. So seeing people every two to four weeks in the EML, they do sort of make provision for monthly visits. As for our patients, it's quite difficult to get to the clinic um, every two weeks. Just in terms of taking the reading, I'm not going to go through all the steps of taking a proper blood pressure reading. Very important if you're going to make a decision about starting somebody on treatment. Um, but remember that we usually take first visit three readings, one to two minutes apart, all rules observed. Um, and then you use the average of the second and the third reading to decide on what the blood pressure is that you are going to treat today. So the, the important thing when we are deciding on if we're going to start, start treatment today or whether we're going to start one or two drugs is depending on the risk of your patient. Um, this is out of our the latest international guidelines in terms of risk assessment. Um, and what we're basically looking at is what's the level of the blood pressure and then looking at whether there are other risk factors. Um, and the EML is still a little bit more conservative internationally. They're getting more and more strict in terms of how many risk factors starts increasing that risk. So in the EML, um, the cutoff at the moment is three cardiovascular risk factors means that we're actually going to consider um, going in with a with, um, higher level of treatment. So just notice that's already uh, men over 55 years of age or women over 65 years of age, anybody who's got a cholesterol over 5.1 or an LDL over 3, anybody obviously with diabetes. Um, and then abdominal obesity, the EML still has that cutoff of 102 centimeters for men and 88 centimeters in women. Um, with the lower cutoffs for our South Asians and Chinese men. But I think more and more there's a, a recognition that we're using more than 80 centimeters generally in women and more than 94 centimeters in men would be a waist circumference that would um, consider an increased risk. Um, if you have a family history, so always important to ask if anybody in the parent or a first degree sibling has had a heart attack or a stroke, men under the age of 55 and women under the age of 65 and of course smoking. So patients that are automatically already considered uh, moderate or high risk are those that might have evidence of possible end organ target damage. So for example, if there is some left ventricular hypertrophy or we're starting to see some protein in the urea. Um, even when the GFRs are still not too bad, or early retinopathy. And of course, anybody who's already got cardiovascular disease is considered high risk. So if they've got um, had a heart attack or a stroke, or they have angina, uh, they've got chronic kidney disease, they've had a stroke, um, and they've got some more severe retinopathy. And of course, you're not going to know these if you don't actually go and look for them. So you need to examine and assess your patients properly at diagnosis, including an ECG. So very quickly, just to go through our treatment approaches. 
So the low-risk patient, and there are still provision in the EML that patients who have a blood pressure, that grade one hypertension, and has got less than risk factors, so only one or two of those risk factors, one can still consider lifestyle intervention, but for no longer than three months. Um, internationally, we're becoming less and more and more strict about starting patients on treatment um, early. Um, but anybody already has any of those risk factors, so if they've got three or more of those cardiovascular risk factors we spoke about, or obviously if they've got any um, cardiovascular damage, we're going to start treatment. Um, and then we could start with our good old-fashioned hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams. Um, there's an important note, even in the EML, that most patients actually these days will already be started on two drugs from the onset. And there's not actually that very many patients who benefit to start just on the on the on the single treatment. Um, in a very elderly patients or patients with isolated hypertension, we will always start on the one treatment only um, to try and reduce the risk of falls. So then our moderate to high risk patients. So anybody with a blood pressure of over 160 or over 100 will already be started on low-dose dual therapy. So we'll go straight for two drugs from the start. And this is where there's differences depending on whether you're looking at the EML or whether you're looking at some of the newer guidelines um, where there's much more of a tendency. So anybody already with a grade one hypertension that has established end organ target damage or established cardiovascular disease will also be started on the low dose dual therapy. And this is where the EML makes that comment that 60 to 80% of patients we expect are going to be started on low dose dual therapy right from the start. Um, and with dual therapy, we mean our usual hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 um, combined either with amlodipine 5 milligrams or enalabrol 10 milligrams at night. Um, and then we're going to be seeing our patient every month. We're going to be treating to target and increasing those, dosage, those dosages until we, we get to a blood pressure of under 140, 90. So our very high risk patient is then those blood pressures over 180 and over 110. And of course, if they're symptomatic, discuss with a specialist. And again, here, you would definitely go in with a dual therapy, but you might even consider to going in with full dose dual therapy from the start. So again, that's our hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 milli milligrams, but you might combine them straight off with amlodipine 10 milligrams or um, with the enalapril 20 milligrams. And just remember with our enalapril, um, especially if you're starting on such high dosages to within two to four weeks to double check that potassium. In patients um, that we are still not managing on a combination of three drugs, so you would always start with your hydrochlorothiazide, either your amlodipine and or enalapril. If they're not on target, you would add your third drug in, treat it up to full dosages. Um, but if they are now on those three antihypertensives and the blood pressure is not yet controlled, one of those, which is a diuretic, which would be your hydrochlorothiazide usually, we would call that resistant hypertension. And then just to note, our fourth drug here, um, fourth choice of drug is our spironolactone. Start off with the 12.5 milligrams, start rate up to 25, and please remember to keep an eye on the GFR and the potassium. Um, I would advise, though, that if you are considering resistant hypertension, to just make sure you've done a few blood pressures, maybe even at the clinic um, or even an ambulatory one if it's possible, just to make sure the patient does not have white coast hypertension and their blood pressures are only high when they're coming to see you at the hospital. Last couple of notes in terms of which antihypertensive we choose. So we're normally quite good at starting our hydrochlorothiazides, but how do we decide between amlodipine and uh, nalopril, for example? So amlodipine, definitely better in our black patients, um, but also notice a good choice in patients with angina um, and our elderly, the patients who's had a stroke or isolated systolic hypertensions, amlodipine will also be your first choice. Um, but in Alipril, we do want to consider in those patients who, for example, have um, heart failure, very important, especially if they've got left ventricular hypertrophy, um, and of course, in our kidney and diabetic patients. Some patients you would also use a beta blocker early on. So, for example, in our post-myocardial infarction or angina patients, very important in all our patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, we do want them to have them on carbidilol. Um, and then hydrochlorothiazide um, is usually in the mix, but very important if you have patients with fluid overload, such as heart failure, and also a very good option in our stroke patients. Um, and lastly, there's a, level, a couple of last options one can consider. So, for example, if patients have got renal failure and some of the drugs are not, op um, are not op 
uh, options or you've had side effects, hydralazine is a good option. The only challenge with hydralazine is that it's a three times a day dosing. Doxazazine in our old men with some um, prostate hypertrophy. Um, and as we mentioned, remember your covidilol for your, for your heart failure patients. And then just a last note, if you do have patients where the GFR is under 45, um, we would usually replace our hydrochlorothiazide with furuzamide, and then you would have to use a BD dose, that 20 milligrams BD.